also read uh, Lord's Day 17, which you can find in the a Book of Praise, page 531. Lord's Day 17. Lord's Day 17. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection he has overcome death so that he could make us share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power we too are raised up to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is to us a sure pledge of our glorious resurrection. As far as the catechism. Brothers and sisters, today we come to Lord's Day 17. So the resurrection. Before we begin, I want to say two things. First, it's tempting to look at the resurrection as something that we simply believe by faith, and that's the end of the matter. But after reading through all of the relevant Bible passages and through a lot of other material this week, I've begun to realize that the resurrection is way more than just something that happened and that we believe. It, it, it's theologically rich, and I hope to share some of that with you. Second, we need to recognize that the resurrection is monumental. I mean, you think of the most important thing that's happened in the history of the world. If it's not the resurrection, you've missed it. The resurrection is the most important thing besides perhaps creation that has happened in the history of the world. And without it, Christianity would not exist. I mean, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 15. He's very clear on that. Every one of us would be destined for hell without the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would be no spiritual power to fight sin. And without the resurrection, Christ's body would be dead. The Son of God, his divinity would have survived the cross, but his body would still be dead. And the, I, you can just imagine the consequences of that if that were true. And we'll get into that. The point is that the resurrection is no small matter. And today I want to show you that by confessing that we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, we're saying some very significant things. So let's start with our first point, he is risen. And this first point, I really want to answer the question, is he? Is he risen from the dead? You know, in history, many people have attempted to deny this fact. Some people have denied the resurrection altogether and say Jesus is still dead. The disciples stole his body. Again, this theory is, uh, there's no proof for this whatsoever, obviously, and no proof has ever been found for it. Others say that Jesus rose from the dead physically, or spiritually, sorry, but not physically. So the Jesus that the disciples saw, and he moved through walls, that Jesus was not a human being, but only God. Or perhaps the sp only Jesus' soul rose. Uh, that's been attempted. But this, I believe, is proven false when Thomas puts his fingers in Jesus' hands. Jesus is not a ghost after the resurrection. And there are two major proofs that we know that how we can say, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. Two proofs. Number one, the empty tomb. The book of Mark, in particular, emphasizes the empty tomb. The ending of Mark, I do not believe. The, if you look in your Bible and you read the end of uh, the book of Mark, and there's a whole section there that says it wasn't in the original manuscripts, I would agree with that. The book of Mark is supposed to end with an empty tomb. And in Mark's view, the fact that the tomb is empty is enough. Jesus must have risen from the dead. 
And the second proof that we have of the resurrection through scripture is that Jesus appears to his apostles and to also to more people. Interestingly, we read a passage from 1 Corinthians 15, and Paul in that passage talks about a number of different appearances of Jesus. I think we're not as familiar with these as we might realize. Right? And look at, let's take a look at them. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, or verse uh, 5, it says he appeared to Cephas, as Peter, and then to the twelve. So these are two appearances. Then he says in, in chapter, or verse 6, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Now we don't have a record of this other than this. But it seems that Jesus appeared to an assembly of Christians and maybe they weren't Christians so-called really yet. Pentecost did not happen yet. But 500 people who believed in Jesus at one time. And so it's not just the apostles who were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection, but many other people. Paul says some of them have, have, have died since he wrote Corinthians. Uh, it also says here in verse 7, then he appeared to James and we think this is James, the brother of Jesus. Could be an apostle. But um, church history sort of suggests that it's James, the brother of Jesus. Then to all the apostles. And then he says, last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And that is the Damascus Road appearance. Jesus appears to Paul on the Damascus Road. And I... I'm not always sure what to make of this because it seems that on the Damascus Road Jesus appears. But I, I, I guess what Paul is saying and I, is that I saw the body, I see Jesus in his full human body on that road. And he counts that as a resurrection appearance. Perhaps Stephen in Acts 7 saw the same. And so these are a lot of appearances. Hard to fake, all of them. And frankly, I, I, I don't, it's pretty unreasonable to look at all this and say, well, you know, it's all lying. You know, this is just a cleverly made up myth. I don't, I don't, I think when I meet people on the street or, or, or even yesterday at the uh, festival, when they try to make that kind of, I just don't, I don't, I don't respect it. I just sort of say, look, that's not reasonable. I don't, I don't really want to argue with that. Obviously, People saw this. If you want to call them all liars, you're welcome to do so. But I, I don't. I just don't think that's a respectable position. So, here, but here's another question that's often uh, brought up. The question is, why did Jesus only appear to the apostles and not to, let's say, the Jewish high priest? If Jesus really rose from the dead, why not appear to everybody, the Romans and the Jews too? Wouldn't that put the matter to bed? Here's the thing. If the Romans and the Jews did not believe in Jesus before he died, they certainly weren't going to do it after he came to them as in his resurrection body. You know, John Murray, a theologian, once he said it this way, he said, you know, brute facts are never enough in this world. If people don't want to believe something, they will find ways not to believe it. If Jesus would have appeared to the high priests, they would have tried to kill him again. Their hearts would not accept it. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit in my heart, not from simply seeing the right thing. So that's, a, I think, a good answer for that. Another question. Who actually raised Jesus? Did the Father raise Jesus? Did Jesus raise himself? The Bible says both. Jesus' resurrection is one action by the triune God. Romans 6 verse 4 says, Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. John 10, so that's the Father did it. But John 10 says in verse 17, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. And so there's Jesus is the subject of the verb there. Jesus is raised himself up. 
Jesus even says there in verse 18, no one takes it from me that I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So there's no who did it. They all three did it. And the Holy Spirit is involved as well. So Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that. We confess that. What does it mean? Second point, sin and death are defeated. We know the resurrection happened. What's it for? There are two things, right? He defeats sin and death. Now how? And you know, as Christians, we often think that Jesus defeated sin on the cross. What does the resurrection have to do with defeating sin? Well, what we need to remember is that it all, of course, comes together, but what happens on the cross? On the cross, Jesus receives the wrath of God upon himself and pays the penalty due for sin. But paying the penalty that we owe for our sin does not save us in itself from sin yet. If Jesus pays the penalty and then dies and is finished, nothing is accomplished. Maybe the penalty we owe for sin is paid, but okay. But how is, if Jesus is dead, how is what he accomplished going to then be given to me? My dead Savior can't save me if he's dead. It's an issue. Now, some of us, have, some people have said, oh, well, Jesus' body dies, his human nature died, but the Son of God, his divinity survived, so even so, he could give us all these things in his, in his divinity. Complex theology. But let me say it this way. What you need to realize about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that he, uh, I think we'll just, uh, hope the little guy's all right. Anyway, I think what, what we need to remember about the gospel is something very important. The cross and the resurrection, there's way more to it. The point is that you and I are saved because we're united to Christ. Okay? Bear with me a little bit. Union with Christ. If what Christ did is over there and I'm over here and there's nothing connected between us, it's meaningless. When Christ dies as a human being and rises from the dead as a human being, the Bible's teaching is that you and I did it with him. Why? Because he's human and I'm human. And if one human being did it, he can drag along, so, so to speak, all the other humans who believe in him. So, just as Adam died and all of us are sin sinners now because Adam died and Adam sinned, so it is with Christ because Christ saved us and Christ rose from the dead. If you believe in him, all of us can do it and participate in it. Which means, if the his human body died on the cross, we're sunk because we're not united. We can't be united to God without Jesus' humanity as being part of the equation. That's why Jesus is called the mediator. He's God and man. So through him, we can have a relationship with God. But if he's not human and divine, that's, I don't know how that could be possible. And so his body had to rise from the dead to defeat sin so that he, alive Jesus can give his righteousness to all of us. And it's, I don't know if I'm explaining it perfectly, but I think I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. Number two, he's also more powerful than death. His human body could not be held by death. He's bigger than death. He transcends death. Now listen, this is very important for our religion. 
Think about other religions for a second. Hinduism, for example, believes in reincarnation. And they say, well, when I die, then I'm going to come back in the next life as whatever. An animal, a better human being, higher caste human being, lower caste human being. Okay? But here's the problem with Hinduism. Nobody has ever died and then come back to tell us what, what happened after death. Except for Jesus, but I'll get to that in a minute. No Hindu has ever come back and said, yeah, you know, I died and then I came back and in my other life I was going to be reincarnated as a rat. Nobody, there's no proof. And you know, even in other religions too, you have Muhammad. Muhammad dies, does Muhammad come back from the dead? No. Muhammad has no idea what happens after death. Buddhism, similar. Buddha points to the way to enlightenment, to some sort of nirvana, or a, there's a name, I forget the name of it. And he says to all of us, this is what you need to do to be enlightened. But he cannot tell, he dies. He doesn't come back from the dead either. He can't tell us what happens after the dead. We're taking, we really, the Buddhists have no idea really in the end. They have no proof. But in Christianity, Jesus dies. He comes back from the dead. And he says, listen, this is the way. In me, you can transcend death. Why? I've been there. Even if Jesus isn't God, if he put his godness to the side for a second, even as a human being, he can say, I died, I came back, I can tell you how to get to the eternal life on the other side. That is a massive thing to confess. And Jesus doesn't just die as a human being and then come back. He comes back as a human being. Beating heart, sinews, holes in his hand, fingernails, lungs. He's not just a spirit. You know in Harry Potter, if you've ever read the books, there's all these spirits and the, there's these ghosts in the castle that live in the school. And certain people, they die and they remain on earth as ghosts. Not Jesus. He's a human being. And if he can do it, so can you. No other religion can say that to you. So he conquers death. It does not hold him. And he proves that death is smaller than him. So final point, new life for us too. The catechism also says, so the first point of the catechism was by his resurrection he's overcome death. And then he's, it's also saying he overcame sin right, so that he can make a share in the righteousness which he had obtained for us by his death. And now the second point is by his power we too are raised up to a new life. The Catechism lists Romans 6 verses 5 through 11 as a proof text. And we, that what that means is this is a present tense thing. In this life, right now, we are raised up to a new life by Jesus' resurrection. It's not future. That's coming. We'll talk about that in a bit. But also in this life, right now, through Jesus' resurrection, you and I share in Jesus' resurrection body through the whole power of the Holy Spirit. Union with Christ. Present tense. Just as Jesus' body is raised from the dead, so your heart is being raised from the dead in this life. Whatever Jesus has in heaven, you and I get to have too. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die... So in Christ, all will be made alive. And that's happening now. Now, I want to make a bit of an involved point here, and you got to track with me a little bit. Jesus rises from the dead, okay? What kind of body does he have? Does Jesus have the same body as before? Now, the question I want to ask you is this. Where does he get that post-resurrection body from. 
It's different, clearly, than his previous buddy. Where does it come from? It's where. The question is where. Or perhaps when. Okay, let me describe. I, mean, I want to pull this out. If you think of the history of the world as a series of kingdoms, first we're born into the kingdom of Adam. Death and sin rule, and death and sin eventually destroy us, and our bodies die. Okay, that's kingdom number one. Now, kingdom number two is through Christ, in faith, we enter a world in which sin and death are all around us, but we are being slowly being filled with life, okay? And we're being resurrected slowly. Third, that's kingdom number two. Now, the kingdom number three is when we die, our souls go up to be in heaven with Jesus, okay? And our bodies stay here. And we live there, and there's no sin and death there, but we live in body, spiritual form in that kingdom, that place, the realm of heaven. Now, you all know that there's a fourth realm, a fourth kingdom, so to speak. And that is the new heaven and the new earth. When Jesus returns at the end of time, our, soul, our spirit and our soul is going to be reunited with our risen body to become a human being, same as we are now, except without sin. We're going to live on the new earth with this renewed, glorified body that can't die. That doesn't even have the potential to sin and die. Adam had the potential to sin and die. His, he was not, his uh, humanity was not as complete and total as Jesus and our new earth resurrection humanity. Okay? Now listen. When Jesus comes to earth in, in his resurrection body, his body is from the fourth kingdom. Jesus is living on earth and walking around as somebody who's visiting us from the future, from the future new earth. He's showing us what we're going to have when we're on that new earth. If you went in time and you were forward in time and you were able to walk around on the new earth and look around and look at all the people, you would see people like Jesus in his post-resurrection body. That's what Paul is trying to say repeatedly in the New Testament, especially in 2 Corinthians 4, for example. Also in 1 Corinthians 15, this is what Paul is trying to get through us, to us. He's like, look, you're looking at Jesus. He's from the future in a sense. He's from, he's what we're going to be. Jesus' resurrection is a giant banner teaching us about the new earth and the new heavens. It's future us. That's why Jesus said, that's why the third thing in the catechism says is Christ's resurrection is to us a sure pledge of our glorious resurrection. The one we're going to have at the end of time. We all are going to become the same as Jesus, just without the divine nature. And so Paul's whole point in the New Testament is to say, in so many areas, is to say, listen, that's who you're going to be. It's going to happen right now while you live in the second kingdom of death. Christ is slowly building you up to that. And the resurrection is the proof that it will happen, and it's the fountainhead. Jesus is called the firstborn. From him, all of this comes into being. So Jesus is called the first fruits, the firstborn. Because the rest of us will be born in the same way. Now you might ask, why do we have to suffer in the meantime? Why don't we just go straight there? Well, actually, you know what? Here's a, here's a piece of comfort for you. If you've had infants who've died at birth through miscarriage or something similar, they get that privilege. We often are deeply wounded and we grieve about these things. We think, oh, how could God take this child from me? But really, it's a giant act of mercy. That body that Jesus has, he's walking around with, they will go to heaven, they will go straight, and they will not have to suffer. There's thankfulness in that. Also, 
we are left on this earth to preach Jesus to those who still don't have him. And we're here to preach to people that our Savior is alive and not dead. That's what we're doing on Sunday. You know, in the early church, Sunday was the resurrection festival. The early church did not Sabbath as much as it celebrated the resurrection. Because that's the hope that we are, we are to the rest of the world. And the little glimpses of Jesus' eternal body are emerging through us. And those glimpses help the world see that the message we preach is actually true. We are being saved from sin so that we can slowly show the world that Jesus is alive. That's God's purpose in us, in this world. And the resurrection is at the center of it. Because we're showing the whole world that there's a glorious humanity to come and we can be part of it. That's the glory of Christianity. It's not just how to get saved. No. Christianity is you get to live on a new earth in the body that Jesus has. And he's going to get you there. And our job is to preach that until it happens.